where we're going back 50 years to an event that probably most of you have not heard of because I, I was not really aware of it until Mike brought it to my attention. On October 1st, 1970 was the final game played at Connie Mack Stadium, formerly known as Shy Park in Philadelphia, North Philly, where it was on the really just built in the middle of a uh, of a neighborhood like the old stadiums were. But that night, what makes this event interesting and why it's a feature of our mini-sode is because as soon as the game was over, they started ripping everything out of the stands and tearing that place basically apart to have a piece of memorabilia down the road. And Mike, this is a very interesting topic that you pulled up. I'm not sure how you came across it, but this is not something I was ever aware of. And don't really, I don't think I've ever heard about really Connie Mack Stadium in general. You know, I was just doing a deep dive research to try to come up with an on this day type of episode we could do for the mini-sode. And I happened to stumble across this. And not only did these fans get after it after the game and rip the stadium apart, they started doing it during the game, which we'll get to. <laughs> I can't believe I'm with you. I cannot believe I never heard about this story. We always hear about the shenanigans that Philly fans have done over the years. This is right up there with some of the classics that we all know about. Yeah, we're going to take you up to that night when it all when it all happened. But let me just give you some history on Shy Park because it's very, a very uh, interesting park, and there was a lot of things that took place there. There's a lot of history that was in that park. It's now, I think, a church, but it was built for $1 million. It's the first concrete and steel stadium. It used to be those old rickety wooden stadiums they built. This is the first one that was kind of a marvel of engineering, essentially, but it was built in the middle of a neighborhood, as I mentioned, and a couple of like notable events that happened there. Babe Ruth got his first hit as a Yankee at Shy Park, Mike, April 14th, 1920. The first night game of the American League was played there in 1939. One of their biggest events was the 1950 World Series. Really one of the only times, there's a very small time frame where the the Phillies were actually good. It was the A's turned into the Phillies. Both teams, you know, before they transitioned, played there in Connie Mack Stadium, a.k.a. Shy Park. That's one of the reasons I bet this stadium lasted so long because of that construction feature that you mentioned. Just wanted to make sure, uh, that's, that's a good point you brought up about the construction. And, um... Look, the, the Phillies, one thing I, I learned from doing a little research on the park is exactly what you just mentioned. The Phillies overall during this period where they played at uh, Connie Mack Stadium, they weren't that good of a team, you know. But with that said, this is kind of like Philadelphia's version of, let's say, Ebbets Field. Like right. the stadium in the middle of a neighborhood where, you know, people have very, very fond memories of going there and watching games throughout the years. So that's the kind of stadium we're talking about here from a Philly perspective. Another interesting part of this ballpark was because it was built like it was, where literally it was like a square block. I mean, the ballpark center field was a point essentially in the outfield. It was like 470 to center field if you went straight out to the corner of center. But in right in one of the I think it was either left field or right field, I can't remember, but there was these houses, essentially, if you've ever seen Philly, there's kind of those those tall two- or three-story houses kind of built on top of each other, you know, rows of them on the streets. Row well, houses. They're called row houses. Okay, row houses. Perfectly. You're my northeast, yeah. uh, you know, hook up there. So either you know. row houses or, or multifamily homes. Right. Either one. Right. So they had, you know, the streets are lined with these, typical big city, you know, some homes and whatnot. But they actually built rooftop bleachers on these things back in the day because the fans wanted to get in, you know, there was, it was, it was the best, one of the best views there. Cause you're basically right on top of the stadium, right across the street from the fence essentially. So they brought them up. They started serving drinks. The kids would go down to the, the local uh, grocery store. They'd buy hot dogs for a nickel. They'd sell them for a dime on the rooftops. And then eventually the, because I think the great depression and like money was tight, like a lot was happening financially. The, the owners decided, you know what? We're putting up a wall to block the view. And they put up this really tall fence. I think it was called like this Connie Mac spite fence is what it was known by, even though <laughs> he wasn't the one that had the idea to do it. But because I think he was the, the GM at the time or the owner at the time, they decided to do that. But because of that, the fans got upset or whatnot, but they blocked that. But they had rooftop bleachers long before what you see now at Wrigleyville. Yeah, I was just going to say, Wrigleyville, did they take their lead You know, from Shy Park? That's an interesting point you brought up there. But also interesting is the fact that owners have been squeezing fans <laughs> for more money, apparently, since at least the Great Depression. <laughs> yeah, it goes way back. It's The same battle has been played for, for years and years. One of the other cool things that I came across about this park and an event that was played there was Pottsville, the Pottsville Maroons, Mike. The 1925 NFL Championship controversy. You wear this at all? 
Uh, the only thing I know Pottsville for is that where that's where Yingling is located. Exactly, America's the oldest beer. brewery is 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 located there. But before, I mean, well, I guess not before that. During kind of the the start of Yingling and whatnot, Pottsville had a NFL team for for a few few years before they eventually moved to Boston. So here's what happened earlier in the year: Frankfurt Yellow Jackets, who is Philly's team, scheduled an exhibition game between a team of former Notre Dame All Stars and the NFL NFL's best team in the East. Well, at the time, they thought they would be that team. Frankfurt did. They thought, okay, this is perfect. We'll get this lucrative match against the Notre Dame All-Stars. This is perfect. Well, Pottsville was better than expected. They ended up pulling ahead in the standings, and they won the right to play in that All-Star game. Well, Pottsville's stadium was a high school stadium. It had a capacity of around 6,000 people. So their owner decided... Let's book this game in Shy Park instead. It's a much larger place. We will uh, take this financial windfall. We will enjoy this game and make a lot of money. Well, Philadelphia was in the Yellow Jackets designated territory, so Frankfurt complained to the league. You can't play this game here. This does not work. So the commissioner at the time, Commissioner Carr, warned the team owner, you will be suspended. Your franchise will be suspended if you play this game in Philadelphia. Well, they went ahead and played the game. Later claimed they got verbal permission from the NFL over the phone, although they denied that. The Maroons went on to win the game 9-7, which was a huge win for pro football back in the day, beating the Notre Dame All-Stars. And the fans did not show up as expected. So not only was it a, 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 a end up being a bad thing for them long-term and a detriment to their team, they didn't make as much money as they expected. And of course, the NFL, as they threatened, went ahead and suspended Pottsville, removed them from the NFL preventing them from finishing their season. They had already beaten the best teams in the league, so they had every argument for the championship, would have been champions. And instead, the Chicago Cardinals went on to win the NFL championship that year. They had the best record and were awarded that title. The NFL ended up re reinstating the Maroons to the NFL the very next season, but eventually they would go off to Boston. Pottsville actually appealed uh, this in 2003 to the NFL to try to get that championship reinstated, but it was voted down 30 to two by league owners. The only two owners that uh, were in their favor were actually Pittsburgh and Philly. They're in the same state as them, but uh, it is now kind of forgotten about and in the past, but very interesting note. That's a bizarre story, but you, of note also is, you know, you know how like when Alabama is really good, they're like, hey, would Alabama beat the Browns? Right. <laughs> well, we actually saw that in this case, you know, like a real life college team playing a pro team. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, pretty nuts. One last note on this park, the two home games this team played, the very beginning when they opened the stadium and the very last game, they both won. They opened up with the A's beating the Red Sox 8-1 to on opening day, 1909. And then the Phillies beat the Expos 2-1 on October 1st, 1970, the park's final contest. That's what we're talking about, Mike. So let's let's talk about this night and what happened really quick and, and talk about how this kind of really set the tone for Philly sports fans maybe moving forward. I thought what was most, most interesting about, about this, going back and actually looking at some of the video and hearing some of the stories, there was a guy, and I don't, I don't know how coordinated this was and how well known across the city that this was going to happen, but this game went to extra innings. And as soon as the final run came across the plate for Philly, there was a fan that got to home plate within four seconds, literally within four seconds of the guy sliding across home. He was out there trying to rip the home plate out of the dirt. That guy trying to rip home plate out of the dirt to me is like the iconic moment of this uprising. I mean, he quickly realized he couldn't rip it out of the dirt, but it was hilarious. <laughs> and I when he couldn't, he, he grabbed a bat, the next closest thing to him. He picked up a bat that it might have been the, the game winning hit because it was in play. He grabbed that and ran off and you didn't see him again as everybody else stormed the field. Yeah, you know, one thing I noted is that the fans were actually coming through the gates to attend the game with tools to rip <laughs> the stadium apart. It was like a construction site. You know, I just, I thought that was funny. That's something that stuck with me during my research is th these fans are actually bringing tools. They're there for one thing during that game, and that's to absolutely rip the stadium limb from limb. I mean, we're talking chairs, right? Stadium chairs. We're talking toilets. Yeah, urinals. Urinals. <laughs> When we say everything, and it was like it was, there was thirty-two thousand people there. It wasn't like there was, you know, uh, you know, two thousand people there uh, enjoying their last memories of Shy Park. Yeah, um, th this was a, this was a, this was a lot of people. And like you said, they stormed the field after the game to basically now take it to the next level and rip up everything that was on the field. And Shy Park would, as you said, kind of rip to the the studs essentially that night. And 
It was only a, a year later, I think a fire was set inside the park, just, you know, randomly the, the, the parks closed and somebody, you know, some hoodlums broke in and, you know, just, just, just because started a fire and it kind of just laid there in, in disrepair for many years until eventually being torn down in 1976, uh, just six years later. But pretty crazy the way that came to an end because, I mean, you see like stadiums, you know, you now it's very controlled. Hey, we'll pull the seats up and we'll sell them to you and we'll make a few extra bucks off of you. But, you know, sometimes you'll see people take some stuff and, and whatnot. But I mean, this was, hey, we're grabbing everything. Was this, I mean, is this a common thing in the, this era or is this just a Philly sports fan? No, like you said, uh, taking a souvenir with you, your team's last game in a stadium is not rare. Even taking a seat is not rare, but bringing actual tools <laughs> to take apart the whole stadium is, I mean, they left it in ruins essentially from the way they described it. And w one thing of note is what Philadelphia sports fans now sort of look at their bad behavior as like a badge of honor. Right. But I read a lot of art. I read a couple articles from like from the day about this game. And there was a lot of people from Philly that were sort of disappointed in how this stadium went out. You know, remember, this is a stadium that a lot of people grew up going to very fond memories. And now the last memory and the lasting memory of the stadium is it being ripped apart. So there was there was it was a little bit of controversy with this. Uh, looking back on it now, it's pretty funny. Um, but in the moment, you know, there's a lot of people who had problems with the way this went down. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I think it's probably like how they are now. It's, there's a side that really is upset about it and then a side that's proud of it. Because I was watching, you know, one clip on YouTube as you kind of – it's one of these wormholes you can just go down and watch stuff forever, right? Well, I came across a video from like, I don't know, five or six years ago where it was one of these hometown memories. And there was a guy from Philly who was talking about how he was at the game and like how he yeah. was proud. He took that's a chair. The first, that's the first video I watched too on YouTube. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wow, what a nice moment. And then you keep on going down the rabbit hole, like you said. And you're like, Jesus, this was like a riot. What is this guy so proud of? I know. You know, that's crazy. And, you know, you have a, a, a fan base that, is known for booing Santa, throwing batteries at J.D. Drew, having a jail at the vet. With all that said, I can't believe this moment isn't mentioned as much and sort of in concert with those other moments I just mentioned. Yeah, This is like the start of Philadelphia fans behaving badly in public. And I feel like, you know, like we both mentioned at the beginning, this is the first we ever heard of it. Yeah, pretty crazy stuff, but it happened 50 years ago from our release date of this episode, October 1st, 1970. Pretty wild, and really, it doesn't seem like that long ago, 1970, but you look at the pictures, and, you know, it's it's old school. This thing opened in 1909, and, and it uh, no longer exists. As I mentioned, it is now a, a, a church or some kind of worship center there, and, you know, this is in North Philly, too, the very opposite end of where all their sports parks are now, and I've never been in that area. I'm kind of interested to go over there and and kind of see that area now because that's where a lot of they had a couple of parks up there back in the day before eventually moving to veterans and and could there be an even more opposite stadium than than veterans mike from what this was oh absolutely not so i've been to veterans stadium multiple times for a couple eagles games but a lot of phillies games back in the day and that was it's literally the worst sports venue i've ever been to <laughs> by a mile you felt like you were no matter where you were sitting you were sitting three miles from home plate so that that stadium left little to be desired and uh you know until it got ripped to shreds here it seemed like there was a lot of charm in uh, Shy Park. Yeah, and I, I miss those old stadiums. I mean, you know, I'm glad like a Wrigley still exists, and I got to see Yankee Stadium you know, before it was torn down. And you just these these venues are, are you know so hard to find now. Rickwood Field in Birmingham too. If you ever if you're a baseball fan, you probably heard of it. It's uh, it's the oldest park now. I think when they have a, a yearly game that the Birmingham Barons play in, but. Seeing this old architecture and, and whatnot is pretty cool to see. But, yeah, interesting story, Mike. I'm glad you found this one and, you know, hopefully it made a, an enjoyable episode. And hopefully, you know, you learned something from this mini-sode as we wrap it all up. But overall, very interesting to, to hear the story of Connie Mack Stadium being torn down essentially by their own fans on the final night when the Phillies beat the Expos 2-1. So we'll wrap it up, Mike. Enjoy this one, and uh, we'll get back to full episodes soon. But more to come. And if you have something you want us to get into or you have a quick note or – you know, a, a day in the in the life of or history or whatever you, you want to send our way, send it over to us. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and also, as always, on distantreplaypodcast.com.